Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Today's interview with Dr. Edward Seitz is the second in a two part series on grant writing. In today's episode, I talk with Dr. Seitz about the three sections most commonly found in grant applications the narrative, the budget, and the appendices. The outline for these three sections can be found at the Social Work Podcast website, along with the first episode, which covered strategies for developing and writing a grant proposal. You can find all of this, as well as Dr. Seitz's thoughts on the role of women in the development of social work in the United States, at the Social Work Podcast website at socialworkpodcast.com. Now, although grant writing is not usually the first thing I think of when someone mentions a good time, I found Dr. Seitz's insights and clear descriptions to be inspiring. And perhaps that's because Dr. Seitz has devoted his entire career of nearly 50 years to child welfare practice, education, and research, the last 41 years of which have been as a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work, where Dr. Seitz was a full professor from 1978 until his retirement in 2006. He was the coordinator of the school's child, youth, and family concentration, and the coordinator of the Child Welfare Certificate Program. Another area of specialization for Dr. Seitz, and one of the reasons why I think this podcast was so fascinating, is that he's developed an expertise and has actually taught in the area of grant proposal writing. He was the principal investigator on at least one federal, state, or foundation-funded grant project every year from 1971 until 2006. He taught grant proposal writing for over 30 years to graduate students from throughout the schools and departments of the University of Pittsburgh. At his retirement, he was the principal investigator of nine projects and programs with total annual budgets of over $30 million and a statewide staff of nearly 100 faculty and professional staff. These projects included research, degree, and training programs in collaboration with 16 universities and provided over 35,000 days of training annually to 4,000 public child welfare employees and 9,000 foster parents in all of Pennsylvania's 67 counties, as well as baccalaureate and master's degree programs for hundreds of child welfare workers annually. Dr. Seitz has not only written hundreds of proposals, but he's been a proposal reviewer for the federal government, state agencies, foundations, universities, and private agencies. And currently, Dr. Seitz serves on the board of a foundation and is engaged in institutional advancement work in higher education. And now, on to our interview with Dr. Edward Seitz about grant proposal writing. I was wondering if you could review a generic proposal outline and, and we can include this outline on the Social Work Podcast website for the listeners. Certainly. The uh, answers to these questions are generally presented in an organized format, which has three parts. We'll just call them the narrative, the budget, and the appendices. The appendices are the support documents and technical information. And what I'd like to do is just quickly look at each of these three sections, the narrative, the budget, and the appendices, mentioning what will be in each section and telling just a little bit about each one as we go along. All right, the narrative section. The first thing in the narrative section is probably the last thing that the author writes. It's the cover letter or the letter of transmittal. In some cases, the funders have a specific printed form that must be completed, and filling out that form substitutes for the cover letter or the letter of transmittal. But go back to my earlier comments that this is a contract. Somebody has to sign a contract, and usually it's the top official in the organization from which the proposal is being submitted who has the authority to sign contracts. Sometimes it's the CEO, sometimes it's the chairman person of the board, sometimes it's somebody else. But that cover letter on letterhead, which shows the official organization and the official signature of the of the person uh, able to uh, transmit this proposal and commit to it, is is critically important. It's a very short paragraph. It doesn't get into the content of the proposal. It is uh, it is part of the legal contract, and it comes on top. Though it's as I said, probably written last. Next would ordinarily come an abstract or executive summary. This is a one-paragraph 
opportunity for the author to deliver a knockout blow. I have to say that I have read thousands of proposals and I've watched other people read proposals. And sad to say, I think there are a number of proposals submitted in which the only thing ever read is the abstract. The reviewers conclude from the abstract that this is not a worthy proposal or not it does not in some other way fit to the needs of the uh, funding agency. This is uh, uh, the part of a proposal that has to be very, very carefully considered and, and crafted to convey in the most cogent way the idea that the author has and the reason uh, for submitting the proposal. Remember that this is a generic outline. You would always be following the outline provided by the author, by the funding agency if there were such. Next might come a table of contents, and whether or not you included this would depend on the length of the proposal and how many pages were in your page limit. You might not have enough pages to include a table of contents. But if you have a very long and complicated proposal, it could be very helpful to the reviewer to be able to flip to a certain page uh, when they want to re- reconsider or review uh, a part of the proposal that they had already read. Next would be uh, an introduction or a background statement. Now, this really has uh, two parts. One is that you want to introduce your organization. Who is it that brings this proposal to the table? What do we know about them? What is their uh, history in dealing with this uh, kind of an issue? What is their track record and so forth? Who are they? How old are they? How big are they? Uh, Who are their collaborators? Things of that sort. And the background really refers not so much to the organization but the uh, foundational basis for the proposal which is about to be made. What, what exactly are we, gonna, or are we going to present here, and where does it come from? Nothing springs from nowhere. So what is the previous research you've already done on this, previous research other people have already done on this? What, what brings it to the table? This is a brief section. This does not have to be lengthy. And again, you'll be guided by the specific word or page limits provided. Next comes a need statement. There is some problem you seek to address. There is some need about what you're concerned. There is some uh, need for uh, intervention, perhaps. What is that need? Perhaps you can convey that uh, strongly with uh, statistical data. The high rate of unemployment, the high rate of teenage pregnancies, the high rate of delinquency in this particular neighborhood, the high number of kids that have dropped out of school in this particular school, or some other uh, critical uh, piece of information like that which will convey the need and the fact that there is a need, uh, a great need, which uh, you seek to address. And so, with all that, you now get finally to the proposal, which has a number of subparts. We get to the proposed program, if you will. And here I can say, um, I can give you these categories very briefly because they're probably familiar to most people. First, the goals, which are the broad statements, the overall one or two things that you would hope to accomplish by carrying out this project, whether it's a research project or a treatment intervention or whatever. What are the objectives, which are the concrete, measurable uh, implementation, you might say, of the the goals, the way the, the goals will be operationalized, the operationalization of the goals. And then the design or methodology. We often talk about methodology in research. We often talk about design in other kinds of proposals which deal with uh, programmatic interventions. How will you set this project up? What will it consist of? Sometimes location is important, and you might want to include that information. It, it, the location might be in a an area of high crime or uh, an, an area of high number of uh, elderly people or uh, some other aspect of the area in which you're operating use, using census tracts or, or city data or county data or some such thing as that, maybe state data. You can help the funder understand why it's important to do this in this particular place and not someplace else from which the, the funder may also have another proposal. How will this be staffed? Who will do it? What are their qualifications? How many of them are there? What would the experience be that they bring to the uh, project? Sometimes uh, this involves volunteers who are not paid persons, and uh, proposal writers occasionally uh, think that if 
if volunteers are not going to be paid for through the budget, there's no need to mention them. But that's not the case. The funder wants to know, the prospective funder wants to know the overall way in which you will go about this and who those people are. How will the project be administered? What levels of oversight will there be? How will the uh, finances be taken care of? This has to do with accountability, credibility. So it's important to show how this project of yours and how the uh, coordinator or director of this project fit into the larger organization. To whom does the project director answer? And to whom does that person answer? Where in the organization are the uh, official financial employees of the agency involved and so forth? Oftentimes, an implementation timetable would be indicated. Uh, What will you do in the first month, in the second month, in the third month, in the sixth month? At the end of the first year, where where will you be? Perhaps this is a multi-year project. These timetables can be very closely tied to the goals and objectives so that the prospective funder realizes that you have thought this through, that you know exactly how you're going to go about it, what you will do first and next and so forth. This is often done graphically. You can actually show a timeline with various parts of the project represented on the timeline. If there are any special needs that uh, the project requires, such as special equipment or especially designed facilities, it might be for a daycare center, for example, or for some kind of a research project, this would be the place to include them. Pretty near the end of this project, or the end of this part of the proposal, the narrative section of the proposal, is the um, evaluation of the project. No project can be completed without an evaluation. That's just simply not an option in this day and age. So we have to convince the prospective funder that we are serious about evaluation, that we are going to be able to do it objectively, that we have a plan for doing it. This may involve uh, research instruments. It may involve uh, using third parties. There are a variety of ways this can be done. The project's evaluation and how you will be able to document whether or not you have succeeded in completing the project as you proposed it must be detailed. This would be followed in the in the narrative by something called the budget narrative. Again, depending on the size of the proposal and the size of the budget, this might not be necessary. A budget narrative is a word picture, a paragraph version of the budget, in which you say how much it will cost, who is going to cover that cost, for example, how much will the agency itself contribute, What are you requesting from the prospective funder? Are other funders involved? Who are they? What is their proportionate share? So this is a place to paint a word picture and particularly to answer questions that a prospective funder might have after looking at the budget. Perhaps there's a large equipment line or an unusually large staff line or maybe an unusually large travel line. You probably would want to explain, Jonathan, the trip you planned to Hawaii and have included in here. So uh, unusual things, things which would attract uh, the prospective funder's attention and raise the prospective funder's eyebrow, perhaps raise a question. Here's your chance to get the jump. You give the answer to that question before they find it, before they find it for themselves. You can do this in a budget narrative. Sounds like a, uh, a good sales technique. You overcome the objective before it even arises. That's right. So that's the narrative section, and the next section of the three is the budget. Is that correct? That's correct, Jonathan. Budgets are simply another way of stating the proposal. You know, I think if there's one thing that intimidates people about proposal writing, it might be the budget. They, a lot of people don't consider themselves particularly gifted with uh, mathematics, let's say, and they think this is a big mathematics uh, contest or something, which it's not. But budgets can be uh, pretty straightforward and pretty easy to understand. I think everybody probably has some version of a household budget. Maybe people don't write them down. Maybe they carry their household budget around in their head. Well, that's how simple a budget really is. It's not all that complicated. The uh, narrative part that we've just described is the sentence form or the paragraph form of the idea and the proposal. And the budget is the numbers, the rows and columns and totals. Both sections are necessary, and both sections must be consistent with each other. And if there's one 
point I would make about the budget, it is that it must be consistent with the narrative. What appears in the narrative must also appear in the budget. Nothing can be presented in the budget that is not covered in the narrative. Remember I mentioned a while ago about volunteers. be easy to use some volunteers to help uh, with a project, and since you don't pay them, you wouldn't ordinarily think of them as appearing in the budget, but actually they do, and there's a way to do that, and, and it's important. So budgets can be technical. They're a topic for another day, and in the meantime, I think what the best, the best thing we can do is suggest that the author consult with the parent organization and get the uh, technical help that they, they need if they need additional help to do that part. Well, after we've finished the narrative and the budget, and these two are compatible with each other, we have only one part left of the three I mentioned, and that's the appendices. The appendices appear at the end and contain all the technical information that's too detailed to include in the main body of the narrative. The appendices may or may not be included in any page limits imposed by the grant application guidelines, but often they are included in the guideline page limit, and if that's the case, you can't run away with uh, the show here in the in the appendices. You have to ration yourself, be very cautious about what you include so that you don't uh, shortchange yourself in the narrative. Proposal guidelines usually specify exactly what they want, and, and if they're lengthy, as I say, it can uh, diminish the number of pages you have available for the narrative. Well, here are some of the ideas, ideas of some of the things which are requested for the appendices. One might be a bibliography. If you're doing a research proposal, you might have to demonstrate to the National Institutes of Mental Health, which you mentioned a while ago, Jonathan, you might have to demonstrate for them that you've done a literature review and that you know uh, the score and you know the latest research that's uh, available on this subject. Technical data is another area. For example, I mentioned census data, census tracts for the location of the project. Technical data of that sort, you don't have paragraphs and paragraphs of numbers and percents. You might refer to them. You might use two or three of the most cogent in your narrative. But for charts and tables of length, two, three pages, small cells, that would be in the appendix. Letters of support. Very often, letters of support are required this is where the author goes out to uh, other organizations and agencies who are expert in this same area and gets their opinion in writing for the reviewers of the proposal. Is this a good idea? Is this a credible organization? So forth. The table of organization is another item. This would refer to the organization or agency making the proposal. For example, in a university or in a State Department of Welfare, it's a pretty big place. How does this proposal fit into the overall picture? And it goes back to the issue of who's responsible to whom, who is providing the accountability, where does the buck stop? And that's why this is often required. We mentioned staffing in the narrative. It might be important to have job descriptions in the appendices. This would save tremendous amount of space in the narrative, especially if you had one of these proposal guidelines which had unlimited space for appendices. And then you could include uh, job descriptions of those various positions and make it clear what each individual person would do and what their uh, educational and experiential requirements would be for being a part of the project. Vita are the same thing. A curriculum Vita, resume, as some people refer to it, might also be included. They would be sort of companions to the job descriptions if you already know some of the people you plan to hire. For example, you may have a star in your program or a star on your staff, or you may have somebody who's agreed to come and work for you if this proposal gets funded, who has a national reputation. Well, having that person's credentials in the appendices could add weight to the proposal and give the funder an idea of how well prepared and how well qualified the uh, agency is to carry out the proposal. Maps, we mentioned location. Maps might be important if depending on the kind of project. Bids, perhaps there are large things to be purchased, a building, uh, perhaps, or uh, major equipment. A van, uh, for example, is often uh, one of the things I see in budgets. What would that uh, cost? How do we know that the amount you have in the budget is a reasonable amount? A couple, three bids in the appendices would answer that question. Licenses, certificates, permits, uh, occupancy permits, uh, licenses of professionals or other, other people involved, uh, licenses to operate, uh, drug treatment programs, for example. You can't propose to somebody to go out and buy a bale of marijuana uh, without certain papers uh, in your wallet. This would be uh, where that information would appear. Evaluation instruments, we mentioned that to some extent earlier. 
uh, some government uh, funders require uh, official statements that the organization making the proposal does not discriminate or provides a drug-free workplace and other things of that nature, which are usually forms to be signed by organization officials. 501c3 documentation, which is a fancy way of saying, proving that you are, in fact, a not-for-profit organization and therefore qualified to receive these funds. A list of the board of directors, and this is very often requested by foundations, and they don't just want the names. They want to know how long they've been on the board. They might want to know gender. They might want to know race. Uh, they might want to know profession. They want to know what kind of a board you have, what it's makeup is and how it might operate, and this is one of the ways they learn about it. Sometimes you can include a copy of your annual report. Many organizations prepare their annual report in such a streamlined and colorful and graphic way that it's uh, especially well suited to be included in proposal appendices and may actually include much of the other information, like, for example, the list of the board of directors or things of that sort, and make it unnecessary to incorporate it separately. Also, uh, organizational budgets and audited financial statements. Often foundations ask for a copy of your most recent audit, and this is where it would appear in the appendices. If you are involved in research, you may undoubtedly know what an internal review board is or what an IRB is. IRB approvals are important to researchers and to the people who fund research, and so they would be included in the appendix. So you can see that it depends on what kind of a proposal you have. If you're not buying a lot of things that are expensive, you wouldn't have bids. If you're not doing research, you wouldn't have an IRB approval. If you're uh, not uh, hiring any staff, uh, you might not need uh, job descriptions and resumes. So it's an area with a great deal of flexibility. But I think whatever it is that you provide whether it's in the narrative or in the budget or in the appendices, proposal writers have an obligation, have an opportunity, really, to present themselves by putting their best foot forward. I always call these the five abilities. There are five things that you want to convey in writing your proposal, and you won't find these in any of the questions that the proposal guidelines contain. These five things, I'm going to name them and then I'll come back to them just uh, briefly, are feasibility, credibility, capability, accountability, and transferability. Nowhere are you going to be asked, what is your credibility as a researcher? What is your credibility as an organization? You get that question in, in more subtle ways. And in subtle ways, you're answering that question through the whole thing. How you construct the appendices, how well you do the budget, will tell a great deal about your capability or your accountability. So is this project feasible? Are you credible? Are you capable? How will you be accountable? And is this project transferable to anything else? Is what we learn here, is what we accomplish here, something that others will be interested in? For example, a funder may view this as a as a twofer. If I fund this project and it's successful and it's copied by other people, my investment will be multiplied. So it's transferable to another state, another city, another agency, uh, another population. And in that way, uh, you might say amortizes the investment of the of the organization providing the funding. So is it feasible? Are you credible and capable? How will you be accountable? And is this project in any way transferable? Well, so Ed, this has been just an amazing review of of general guidelines for writing a grant proposal. We've talked about some of the issues about writing. We've looked at the three general sections, the narrative, the budget, and the appendices. I'm just wondering if you have any last words of wisdom or or advice for folks who are going out there and, and writing grant proposals. Sure, Jonathan. Uh, proposal writing is like any other skill. Riding a bicycle, playing a violin, it improves with practice. There's no mystery. Just work, just even hard work. What is required is logical, follows clear directions, assumes the proposal writer is intimately familiar with the field of endeavor, the community, and the organization in which the project will take place, and it assumes the author can clearly and concisely articulate the proposal in English 
with very little or no jargon. I'm sure you have read proposals in your reviews. I certainly have where uh, $64 words are, are used by the writers to try to impress the reviewers. It doesn't work. Straight English, uh, assuming English is the language of, uh, of the proposal, is what is required. Some proposal writers thoroughly enjoy their work and view it as some sort of a contest they seek to win. Others see proposal writing as something of a necessary evil. To them, proposal writing becomes a a task they have to complete successfully in order to be able to do what they really want to do, namely their research, their professional practice, or other activity or effort. There are many details it's not possible to cover here, as you can imagine, and many experiences that skilled proposal writers have to share with those who are less experienced. But those come a little later after some experience. It's always easier to answer questions after people have them. My best advice is to get busy right now and write a proposal. Take some small idea with which you're quite familiar, about which you are passionate, and write a proposal to someone to support your effort or your work. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Remember that all proposal writers, including the very best, sometimes receive disappointing responses. Often, the critique and suggestions of such a proposal by the prospective funder will lead to revisions that do result in a grant award. Advice is cheap, Jonathan. Fear is paralyzing. But experience is invaluable. So, get started. You have nothing to lose and much to gain. Well, and on that note, Ed, thanks so much for being here today and talking with us about grant proposal writing. You're welcome. So I'm Jonathan Singer. Thanks for being with me today for this episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode, visit our website at socialworkpodcast.com. If you have suggestions for future podcasts, please email me at jonathan at socialworkpodcast.com. And to all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you back here next time at the Social Work Podcast.